Hi, welcome to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. We are the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas, and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I'm pleased to welcome you to Got Old House and Barn Questions with Steve Bedard and Ann Blackman. We're thrilled to have so many old house and barn stewards with us today. I think we had over 70 people registered, which is amazing. We love sharing practical information and hope to offer a dose of energy and inspiration too. Um, many thanks to our Old House and Barn program sponsors to make these programs possible. And to all of you who are supporters of our critical work to help advance efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. Uh, some housekeeping points I'd like to mention before we get started. First and foremost, if you can, we will be recording this session and to keep the background noise down, if I ask that you please mute your speakers, which is usually on the task bar at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side. Um, that will just keep the background noise down. Uh, today's program will be approximately an hour. Because of the high numbers participating today, we'll first be addressing the questions that were submitted in advance. And I wanna thank all of those who sent in these fabulous questions we'll be addressing today. Once we get through those questions, if you have additional questions you would like us to discuss, please enter them in the chat button down at the bottom anytime during the session today. Um, if you'll put them in there and we will address those after we address the ones that were submitted in advance. Um, and because we've had such overwhelming interest in today's program, we will definitely be having another one of these in March. So if your question doesn't get answered today, I'd be more than happy to talk to you on the phone or you can send me an email, but we'll also be having an additional program um, in March. During this program, we encourage you to set your screen on speaker view, which top right hand side of your screen, you'll see something that says view and there's a drop down menu. And if you put speaker in there, you'll only see the person speaking and not 30 little squares. And before we close today, we will um, choose a lucky winner of today's door prize. Okay. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our consultants today. Steve Bedard. Steve, do you want to say hello so your face gets big? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, Steve Bedard of Bedard Preservation and Restoration has over 45 years of experience working with old structures, primarily houses and barns, dating from 1665 to 1936. Steve uses a common sense approach in all aspects of his work from building evaluation and assessments to complete exterior and interior restorations. He works with mechanical contractors to ensure 21st century comfort and convenience while still maintaining the highest level of preservation standards and ethics. Ian Blackman is a barn preservation contractor who has years of experience working with barn owners to care for and restore their historic structures. Ian established Ian Blackman LLC Preservation and Restoration in 2003 and has been a champion of barn preservation ever since. Lending, leading by example and encouraging others, Ian enjoys offering workshops and on-site tours, helping people understand and care for historic barns and fostering greater appreciation of these valued elements of our agricultural heritage. You want me to so, say something? You can see me? <laughs> thank you, Ian and Steve. Um, and again, I want to thank all of you. We've had wonderful, overwhelming interest in this program, and so many great questions were submitted. And I've separated them into old house questions, barn questions. Um, and I think the first one I would like to address is plat relating to plaster repair. Um, and plaster related issues. And question is, um, I am curious about how to best repair my flaky plaster ceilings. And I think the question relates to um, calcimine. And Steve, would you like to address first calcimine, because I think that's really the root of the problem here, but then also maybe some plaster in general, plaster restoration in general. 
Calcimine paint was a product that was used in the late 1800s and has been used up until 1940s and 1950s. Um, and what happens if you don't get it off of the surface of the plaster? You can, it's very difficult to get a, uh, a paint to adhere to it. And it comes off, the, the first thing I ever was exposed to was back in 1979 where my wife's uh, family bought an old farmstead with old plaster. And I went to paint the ceiling, painted it great, left the room, came back two hours, hours later, and it was like sheets of wallpaper coming off the ceiling. So if you do have calcimine, um, and it's a powdery substance, so if you put your hand up, rub it against the ceiling, and you get powder on your hands, you know that's what you have. There's a couple of products out there, one called TSP, as well as you can use vinegar and hot water, but you really have to wipe all of that calcimine paint off and then seal it with a very high quality paint primer, sealer, and then paint it with a good coat of paint after that. And that's the best way to handle it. Um, you gotta scrape all that flaking stuff off first, make any plaster repairs if you have cracks to it, and then go through that paint process, cleaning and paint process. And Steve, is it important to use Oil-based primer versus latex? Oil-based primer would be better to use, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. And that was sent in by Susan Leifer. Susan, are you on? And if so, do you have any follow-up? I am on, and I really appreciate that because it is frustrating me. <laughs> okay, did you have any follow-up questions on that? No? No, that sounds perfect. They are powdery. So that's going to be my next step. I've got all the old paint off and I'll um, follow those steps. Thank you. Okay. And Steve, she had a second question is what's the best way to hang picture frames and, or any type of hanger on a plaster wall? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, I'm going to, there's all kinds of things you can do. You can use, you can use hangers, you know, hangers, you can use, you could actually Put a small nail in. Usually, if, if you set the nail at an angle down, um, as long as the pitch is not too heavy, it will hold it, and will do minor repair to the minor damage to the to the hole you're creating. Um, there are other ways where you see in some old houses or along the seal along the ceiling, and, and uh, there's a molding that might have knobs in it, and that's how paintings were hung in the in the um, late 19th century. Um, but basically, you can repair any hole um that you you know that you don't need for, the, for that hanger any further but that's usually it's a, it's a minor repair so it's not a big deal so steve is it um is it better to put a screw in instead of a nail or does are you saying it doesn't really matter if it's a small nail and you're gentle yeah as long as as long as the uh as long as the painting isn't very heavy you can just use a nail small nail okay Okay. All set, Susan? Excellent. Okay. Um, next question. Barn window, well, actually, this is a general window glazing question, Steve, or Ian. Um, best points to use? And why does my glazing compound seem to crack after five years? Should I use an oil-based paint before reglazing to prep the wood? That that's the correct thing to do. You need to get the old glazing off, out the points out that are there, um, and prime that window. Uh, if it's an exterior window, we usually use a um, churn Williams A100. It's a perfectly good primer to use for that. You can also use another, any other oil pri oil based primer. Prime the window first, um, and then you're going to use. We're, we've gone to using uh, Sacco putty, which you can order online from the Sacco uh, putty company which is a product that will dry very quickly and allow you to repaint that window more easily. Um, and we haven't had any problems using that in, in issues with cracking or peeling. We have had problems with the old uh, number 66 putty that a lot of people, glazing compound that people use in the past, which takes forever to dry, forever to dry. So that's basically what we've used, what we've gone to using and had very good luck with it. Okay, and just to let everybody know, I plan to send a follow-up email tomorrow and I will put some of this key information in the email so you don't have to frantically take notes, but I'll put links to all these sources like um, Sarco, et cetera. Okay, 
Next question, let's move over to Barnes for Ian or, or Steve, you can both answer. Structural evaluation of the barn. Um, well, first simple question is someone's asking if we have a list of um, experienced barn contractors. The New Hampshire Preservation Alliance does have a list. Um, we also have an online directory of preservation products and services with um, contractor names. And then if you're looking to have your barn evaluated, we also have a small matching grant program to do barn assessments. Um, so I will put that, that's on our website. I will put that link in the email tomorrow as well. Um, so that addressed that one. I am going to share screen of another barn question with some barn photos. Hopefully this works. Okay, oh, that's not the right one, sorry. Let's go with this one. Okay, uh, quest this, these photos were sent in. This couple recently uh, purchased this barn actually for their son and they've had some contractors look at it and with multiple opinions. Um, so some of the questions they asked were, when is a barn deemed beyond preservation and better demolished? So maybe Ian, can you, that's a really broad, tough question, but can you try to tackle it? Well, anything can be, everything can be saved. It's just a matter of how much money is available to save it. And also, um, to be honest, for me, it's what, what's the structure, what, what's the timber frame like? And is it an appealing frame that makes it then worth saving as far as I'm, I'm concerned, you know? Um, so, you know, it, it just depends, you know? I mean, when you talk about something that's, that's uh, at the point where it's going to be, where you can't save it, it's usually already had some collapse, the foundation has problems, the roof hasn't been taken care of. And there's just, you know, there it's, you know, it got sort of the trifecta of problems that then make it much harder to save. Um, but it's, it's really a case by case basis. And a lot of it does depend on budget and the quality of the frame. Can you also comment in on, yes, it's expensive to renovate, to restore, but it's also expensive to build new. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, even so, yeah, the other side of that coin is 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 uh, is when you have a barn and it's got some problems and and uh, you think, well, OK, I, I don't want to invest in this. and I don't want I'm going to tear it down. So I'm, this is separate from building new, mm -hmm. but there's the, it adds to that because there's a cost of taking the thing down and, and that can be very expensive um, in today's world, especially if it's a big uh, Yankee barn. But even a mid-sized barn is going to be, you know, thirty, twenty-five, thirty, that thirty-five thousand dollars to take down in today's money. And um, you know, if it's if the if the if a new metal roof or something gets you buys you time to wait it out, and it's got a nice frame, then I say wait it out. It's got a higher value to your property being a nice timber frame than putting something new in there. Excellent. All right, are are Rana and Joel on the call today? They sent in that question. No. Yeah, we're yes. here. Oh, there they are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any follow-up question for Ian? I don't think I have a follow-up. It's that we need to have this uh, barn looked at. You see the pictures. Uh, we think it's a beauty. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is water running underneath it. Uh, the uh, posts need replacing. Uh, there is a slight leak in the uh, roof, and the roof does need replacing. It's asphalt shingled, and it's from, oh, my God, 30, 40 years ago. This, this uh, is the pic these are the pictures, Beverly, of that barn? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we did not give the interior or get, you know, because we knew there were so many other people. That's, that's all right. It's a, it's a bank barn. So it's, it's, it's got drainage issues. That's making it probably move a little bit. And you could see the posting in the basement right. problems. My bet is you have standing water in that basement in the spring, maybe some of the time. So drainage is an issue, but um, you know, uh, the question then becomes, has the foundation moved? You know, when you go and stand in the basement, you look at the basement is the foundation moving um, uh, use it at bows in the in the in the stone foundation. You know your posting has to be done, uh, but you could you know my and the roof is going. So it's a big it's a big money project all in one piece, right? To to tackle it all. 
Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, as far as the roof goes, if the roof is leaking now and you're not going to jump into the whole project, mm -hmm. then I would put a screw on bolt on middle roof on it for the moment. Cause that can come off if the barn has to be picked up and moved around. Okay. And, and you know that by, if you go inside the barn and, and some of the frame is, is coming apart, you know, like where the knee braces are, if they're, if they're, if the, if the uh, tenant is pulling out of the mortise, you know, and you can see where pegs have broken and stuff like that, then, then, you know, you're going to have to pick the barn up to, to get yes. it back in decent shape. And, and if that's the case, then, then you don't want something on there that's going to freeze the barn in the shape it's in. So a lot of asphalt roofers are going to come and they're going to want to put plywood on that roof, right? And then put new asphalt on it. Well, the plywood acts like a big gusset because it freezes the barn in the shape it's in, you know? So you don't want to do that. The metal will do that at the same time, but you can always take the metal off and then do the support. But you don't want to, have, you don't want to wait a number of years and have the water continue to leak and then start having problems with the frame. You know, like, I don't know if there's any rot in the frame at this point. You know, and, and to be honest, sometimes it's hard to tell when you're inside looking up at the frame because it usually tends to track down the timbers and then you, it, you, you can not see it sometimes. But, um, you know, if it's a nice frame in there, I, this barn, I don't see a lot of, I'm looking at when I, in these pictures, I look at the rake um, going up the gable end. And I look at the, you know, the eave going along the side of the barn and it doesn't look like there's any real huge sags in there, you know, to me, just looking at it from those pictures. You know, so um, I would assume that the, the hasn't been the movement hasn't been too bad at right. this point. You know, um, but this is one of those barns where you're going to take care of the drainage. You're going to do your posting in the basement. You're going to take care of all your organic matter in your basement. You know, and and put in drainage in the basement as well. You know, put some uh, uh, crushed bank run or some gravel down there, and right. reach that new posts on some nice good footings. And that could be just stone footings as long as they're on a nice base of, of crushed stone. You know, you don't have to do concrete. And I wouldn't, you know, in this, in this case, if the, if the stone foundation's not moving, then I would just work with it, you know. Um, but, uh, but and, then, and then get some metal on the roof, you know, and then you can deal with the siding further on down the road. You know, as far as, I mean, it looks like it's a clabbered siding on it right now. You know, it could be expensive to reclabber a whole barn like that, but you don't have to do that. You know, it could be it could be shiplap, vertical shiplap on the sides, you know, vertical shiplap on the gable end, and then you run horizontal when you get up above the to the rake. Uh, but uh, you know that that buys you time, and then you can put if you want to put clabbers on later, you can do that later. You know. Okay. Uh, all right. So if we want someone to come out and give that assessment and maybe get a grant, that small grant to help? Well, you can, you can get a grant that will give you, get you your assessment, but you won't get a grant to do work on the barn. Right. Okay. Yeah, so, it's, good, it's good to have a recipe, you know, something that you're gonna follow that says, hey, these are the priorities, these are the steps you right. can take. And then you can work with that and, and talk with the different contractors and say, this is, this, is, this, is, this is what we came up with and this is what we wanna go. But you know, when the work is getting done, you want to find somebody who's going to look at the whole picture, right? It's going to look at the foundation, look at the structure, look at the roof, and and because those things all, you know, they're all connected, you know. So you want the one person who's going to deal with all of those things. Correct. Is that Steve? No, <laughs> he's, no, he's, no, got, no. he's got more common sense than anybody I know. So it's, you know. <laughs> no, it's it's. He's called Ian. You call Ian. Uh -huh. Ian. If you if you call Ian, he'll work for Apple Pie. He'll come down in the section. Just for good <laughs> Apple Pie. You have to understand we're in Connecticut, but it's only two hours to get up to the bar. <laughs> where are no, you in no Connecticut? We, we're happy to meet anybody who yeah. will help us. Well, bring us. the barn. Bring the barn with you. <laughs> yeah. No, and no, the barn is in New Hampshire. The oh, barn is, is okay. in New Hampshire. Right. Yeah, we're in Marlowe. Okay. Uh, but we are living, We, my husband and I live in uh, in Connecticut and we purchased this land and my son lives on it. Right. But uh, we own it. Okay. But I'd be happy to talk to you about a, our barn assessment grant program so, too. So, so, but the one thing to keep in mind with all of this is once again, is the cost of, if you don't do anything and the cost of taking the thing down, you know, in a new metal roof, even if you can't jump into the pond and swim to the other side, right? A new metal roof is gonna buy you some time, right? 
Okay. And, and shoring up the basement. And the other big thing is shoring up the basement posting. Those are big, right. you know? Right. All right. But we had someone who came and he was going to excavate and put in all sorts of French drains. Yep. And I, it sounded like he's doing the Cadillac of excavation when maybe uh, we're looking for the uh, Chevy <laughs> version. Well, well, we'll, drainage, we'll is, drainage is important for the uphill side and taking the water away, you know, from, from, from getting away from that free, freeze thaw cycle behind the foundation, which is what migrates these bank barns, you know. Um, and, and, but that shouldn't be a huge cost, you know, that should be fairly easy to do. Okay. All righty. We don't want to take away time okay. away. So we'll get in contact and move along. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Thank you. And Ian addressed a bunch of other barn questions in that description, <laughs> in that answer. Um, one was siding, Ian. My 200 year old barn is sided with clapboards over a vertical board without any waterproofing between them. After removing some siding for another project, I found the vertical board is nearly completely rotted through. At the point I cannot nail any of the clabbers back up. Um, how do professionals feel about the longevity of rough cut vertical board hemlock or pine siding? Do you want to address that? Yeah, I'd rather see pine than hemlock because pine uh, hemlock tends to split a lot. You okay. know, um, I, I prefer pine. I and I prefer it to be shiplapped. You know, as far as vertical siding goes. Yeah. I really can't stand board and batten, but that's my personal. Uh, um, view on it. it it makes it board, board and batten is a pain when it comes to around trim around when you know the the uh, top casing on windows and those kinds of things um uh but they don't have to do the the uh i mean obviously it doesn't need to be collaborated you know it like i just right. say it could be just um the ship lap i mean in the old days they they basically collaborated was just uh to you know partly to say hey we've made it so they collaborated the uh the the uh, side of the barn facing the road you know, or, or, or put shakes on it or something like that. It, it wasn't for any other reason. Brendan, are you on? That was your question. No, okay. All right, and he was talking about sourcing the wood at local sawmill. Yeah, I so know. I, in, I, go ahead. Do you want to address that? And if you do, do you dry it out first? Do you give it a period of no, he can get he can he can get dried uh, kiln dried um, uh, uh, shiplap. The, usually, it's planed one side and and sawn the other. Um, uh, I don't know. There's a bunch of different places that have it. Um, I actually tend to buy from Goose Bay at the moment just because um, because they stock two kinds: the premium and and a lower grade. I like the premium, um, but I don't buy. I usually I don't. They have have other shiplap that has what they call a rougher head on it, where it's it's kind of roughly sanded on one side. I particularly like to see the saw marks, so I, I don't like to use that, you know, but. Okay. All right, let's go to an old house question. Steve, what would be appropriate exterior paint colors for my 1835 Greek Revival house? Turn of the 20th century photos show it being white with black shutters. I've also found traces of dark green paint on the exterior window frames. Okay. The first thing you want to do is do some more. You've already done some minor paint analysis, so do some more. See if you've got the corner boards and the clabbers as being the same color, or if they're not the same color, then that means you had a two-tone effect where your your the body was a different color than your trim detail. And that could also include your windows also. So that's the best way to determine what color chart, what colors that you're dealing with, unless you want to have a professional paint analysis done, which can cost three or $4,000, depending on how many samples that you want to send out. Um, we typically use the California uh, paint, historic New England uh, paint chart, which will give you a bunch of colors that are that are, are found in through historic New England, interior and exterior. Most of the colors in there are really good colors and you really can't go wrong. Um, and I believe one of their earlier charts, if you can find one, also also did the two-tone effect where you had the, the different colors for the trim and windows and the body. And it may also uh, give you some indications of what to use for that. Um, that's the best chart, the chart that we use. That chart is approved also by um, National Park Service if you had a building that was uh, on the National Register or State Register and wanted to paint it appropriately. 
Okay. Mimi, are you on? That was your question. No. Okay. Um, and then someone asked about basic contractors in general. And again, we have a directory of preservation products and services that has contractors listed on that. And if there's some type of contractor you're looking for and you can't find it there, feel free to send me an email and I'll try to help you out with a, a New Hampshire contractor that can help you with whatever your current situation is. Hey, can, um, I follow, can I have a follow-up question for Steve on that last one? Sure. Hey, Steve. What yeah. about <laughs> I'm looking for common sense here? What about um, uh, when you got a really old house? Because it is true of barns too, and they've got just multiple, multiple coats of paint on them. You know, and mm -hmm. you've got the clabbers that are starting to crack and stuff like that. Um, when do you uh, pull the trigger and say, hey, it's better to reside than repaint and get to a point where we're not doing this repainting every so many years? You know? That's a that's a really good question. Well, we we operate on the basis basis uh, basically of fifty percent rule. If you can look at this and you do it side by side, you don't yep. do the whole barn or house. You do it side by side, and what you can see, if you say if you can see that there's fifty percent of the clabbers there that you can see, need either need to be repaired or have failed or rotted um, or split, then you can think about resigning the entire side that entire whole section. Um, if it's less than that, then you should be thinking about two things clabbers back in to the existing clabbers. Okay. Of course, you're always you're always prepping for um, for lead paint. You, you're going on a lead paint basis. So you're gonna suit up. Um, you as a homeowner can do it. You don't have to hire someone professionally to come in and, and do your painting for you, but you still should protect yourself as well as the ground. You're gonna put down plastic, on the ground, six mil plastic on the ground. You're going to collect all of the scrapings. You're going to sweep them up and roll that into a dump, roll that into a bag and throw it in the dumpster. Um, but basically, it's a fifty percent rule that seems to work well. Okay. In I asked another question, but I think I'd get in trouble. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. You can't get in trouble. I promise. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to throw this one out there. Let's say you got an old house and it's got zero insulation in it, right? Yep. And you've got that fifty percent rule that's kind of showing up. Mm -hmm. And you've got nice insulation. Your plaster inside is in good shape. Mm -hmm. When would you say? When would you say, okay, I'm going to take off that siding. I'm going to take off the sheathing. I got lead paint over there, and I'm going to do some insulation, rewiring, and everything I got to do from the outside, and then resheathe and reclabber. Because I'm spending eight. Because I'm spending no eight. No problem in doing that at all. You're gonna you're gonna number all the. You're, how how are you gonna do it? Is you're gonna number all of the sheathing boards. Yep. And put them back on the way they were and make any repairs to any sheathing boards after you do your insulation and rewiring if your plaster is good on the interior. If the reverse is true, where your exterior, if you had nice early 18th century clapboards that are feather edged and they're still in great condition and you had plaster inside that wasn't that good, you could also attack it from the inside out. Or right. you could, do, you've done them where it's been a combination of both. One side of the building we've left with the exterior clapboards in, in place, or one room actually. And then the interior plaster was removed and vice versa on another wall. So whatever you can, if you can gain access, the problem comes into play when you have both services are in good condition, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> we're told, and we're told at that point to just worry about trying, trying to make the building as comfortable as possible. So you're gonna insulate your cap, you're gonna, Good, good stone windows and weather strip your doors and you're going to call it a day and not worry about your sidewalls. Right, right. That, well, that's I, I've actually come under this thing where I say, I don't care about our value. If, if you've got a field you can put solar in, I say, put the solar in and put heat pumps in and who cares if you're losing heat, you know? <clears throat> the problem, the... <laughs> <laughs> I got to stop problem. talking. I'm going to take the yeah, whole... Yeah, you do, Ian. <laughs> the problem with the heat pump situation is this. To make the heat pumps work efficiently up our way is that you need, you really do need to have a, a building that's insulated well. It doesn't have to be net zero, but it has to be insulated well. Otherwise, you're going to be adding a lot more heat pump units to get able to keep ETU, you need, yep. that temperature. Other than that, no, it's not a bad idea. Yep. All right, I'm stopping yep. there, Beverly. <laughs> Uh, Beverly Mutri, are you on? Because you had a question relating to insulation. If you are, feel free to unmute yourself. 
I am. There you are. Okay. Do you, you have any follow-up? Well, you sort of touched on it, but it's mostly um, I'm worried about the cap and the floor that's already laid down over the, I think it's blown in cellulose. Mm -hmm. And the only way to put in more insulation is to take up the whole floor. Is that what I think would well, be? Well, is that, is that, do you know if that cavity is already full or is it? No, it's about 50 years old. It's probably okay. gone, mostly gone. Okay. Or partially and, gone. And, and, and I'm sure the critters have been crawling through there and it's yeah. a disaster. That's okay. So basically you, you, you can do, you take up your attic floor in sections and you can number it in sections and remove it. It's usually not nailed down very well. It might be a subfloor underneath it that's not nailed down very well also. So you pick, you label all those, take those up, clean out each bay. You can rent a vacuum cleaner big enough to be able to vacuum the insulation up and put it in bags. Um, and then you're going to vacuum out each bay so it's nice and clean. If you have any rewiring, that's the time to have the house rewired or right. parts of the house rewired. And then you're going to look in the corner. You're going to see where the critters have been crawling from bay to bay through holes that they've chewed over the years around the floor joists and whatnot. So we usually take some, and I didn't, sorry, I didn't bring any. I meant to bring some today. Uh, we, some half inch hardware cloth that mm -hmm. we fold in those areas where they get in just to try to at least slow them down so they can't go from bay to bay to bay if they get back in your house. And then once you get that done, then you re-insulate. And we we really like rock wool bats rather than blown really? insulation. Yeah, and, and fill that bay up completely. And you're gonna wind up with probably an R38 in that eight inch or eight and a half inch cavity um, between the top. Well, we it's only maybe what six inches deep at the most. Eight in, I'm thinking it's probably closer to eight inches. You think? Okay. Least, most of them. Most of them. If it's six inches, that's fine. You put whatever in you can get in. You can then, if it's only six inches or less, and it depends on how much you use your attic. Do you use your attic a lot? Well, for storage, it's a walk-up attic. Okay. So there but was a finished room up there. Okay. Do you use that finished room now? storage just storage. storage i would still try to insulate within that bit was in that amount and it should be eight inches so okay. you should be able to get a pretty good r value in that eight inches the only right. problem with rock wool bats is that you you install them and then you don't move them again it's not something that's, that's easily moved around because the edges want to crumble down and become an issue so basically you cut them and install them in the spaces and then you yeah. put the floor back on top of it and you're done Okay, so the floor is old boards, right? right. They're kind of uneven. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Okay. okay, that's fine. They sound nice. I like them uneven. That's good. You like what? Good wear. That shows good wear. Oh, definitely good wear. Seventeen twelve. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Instant. Hey. Can you address yeah, air works. sealing? Hey, boy, hey. <laughs> what was that, Beverly? Air sealing. Can you address air sealing before you put the insulation back down? Uh, no. <laughs> what do you mean by air sealing? No, just around any penetrations that go up through the attic floor. I mean where the critters get in under the eaves, way in the corners. Yeah. Or if there's venting pipes or anything that go through. Well, there again, there again, if you use the hardware cloth, then you can mm -hmm. also then you can spray the insulation. You can use a I'm not you're not supposed to be, we're not. We're not supposed to be using spray foam insulation. That's the one thing you don't want to be doing. Okay. Is use spray foam insulation. You can use small amounts around the areas that Beverly's talking about, like around uh, pipes going up through. Uh, mm -hmm. You can use them around your uh, outside water faucet, things like that. But the it's not a good idea to use that. Generally speaking, some people use it and do vast areas of the house. The problem with with a blown in insulation is you cannot remove it to make any repairs or damages. Right. You need spray foam. Spray foam. I'm sorry. Yeah, spray foam. Yeah. Whether and, and that's closed cell spray foam. Open cell spray foam is a different animal, but open cell spray foam will actually, if you touch it, will actually crumble. And there is a feeling that it can hold moisture also. So we just recommend you stay away from spray foam in general. Right. Even in the cellar, right? Oh, yeah. Even in the cellar. Not in the cellar. <laughs> Don't spray. Yeah. I've gone in where they sprayed the entire wonderful 
cut granite walls, oh. all of the sills, all of the floor joists. That's and too bad. I've actually had to crawl into a space under a church and chisel out an area, probably one foot by one foot, where two timbers met to, to do an analysis of the framework. And it took me 20 minutes to, ch to chisel that stuff out to be able to look at it. And yeah, so you it's, can, not good. it's just not worth doing. It's not worth doing. But there, there are companies out there that will spray foundation walls and you really don't want to do that, you know? Right. So what do you do about a leaky foundation? You re have it, question. Re repoint it, have it repointed. Yeah. Well, take repoint care of the it. outside and repoint it. So, you know, watch out where you, watch where your downspouts and where your water's coming if you have gutters and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. okay. But yeah, you, you really have to, it, 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 it pertains to old houses as well as barns, as well as any other outbuilding. You should not have a negative grade to the building. When water comes off your roof, it should run away from the building as fast as it possibly can. We, we don't, we haven't been taught this by our grandfathers and fathers because we're too far removed from it, but it's something where soil will actually keep moving up at an elevation on a year to year basis and your mm -hmm. foundation, your building does not move. So you wind up with a negative grade to the building. So water comes off of your roof and then runs right back into the building, into the basement. And then the, the really, sorry, the really smart people put a sub pump in when they put the exhaust hose right outside the window and it just keeps circulating around, <laughs> around. And, and that's okay. So if you have an exhaust, you know, uh, uh, water discharge from a, from a pump like that, you need to make sure that it's far enough away so it'll drain away. Same thing with gutters. I'm not a fan of gutters because no one takes care of their gutters anymore. No one climbs up and does that, cleans them once or twice a year. <laughs> so we don't recommend gutters except in extreme cases. But if you have gutters, you have to make you have to make sure that the discharge is far enough away so it won't rock, it won't go directly back into the building right. and cause cause that freezing and thawing. Ninety five percent of the time, if you do that, that will resolve the water problem in your basement. You will not have to put in any French drains or dig around your foundation or anything like that. It's just a slight regrade. And a good okay. time to check your basement is after a heavy rain or during a heavy rain to see if you see where the water is <coughs> coming in, because that can yeah. help. Yeah, I did mine, my house 45 years ago when we first got there because it was a negative grade of the building. And last year, I noticed we started to get water back in the basement. I regraded it and no more water in the basement again. So to get back to repointing, if you have gaps in the foundation, especially above grade, um, yeah. We change the temperature in our basement in our cellar by 10 to 15 degrees just simply by having it repointed. So that, okay. you, but there again, now you're making things really tight. So now you, you're, you're going to be thinking about a dehumidifier that's going to run from probably May until October ish um, to get rid of that moisture because the moisture doesn't have any place to naturally push out and dry yeah. out and things like that. Yeah. That's well, okay. With, that's with your basement windows, closed close your basement windows leave your bulkhead closed yeah yeah if, if you have a, if you have a if you have a dirt floor basement most people should run a dehumidifier in their basement well if you have a dirt floor basement the best thing to do is is to get it raked out get the muck out of there get anything yeah. that doesn't belong in there no one's using their basements as much as they used to there's no one putting down three or four hundred quarts of canning jars and then, and most people now have gotten their washer and washing machines and dryers out of the basement so there's really no need to have anything stored in the basement. So get all that, anything that doesn't need to be stored there anymore out of the basement. Get the soil, uh, any damp or rotted soil, get it out of there. Get some uh, sand or a little crushed gravel in there. Put down a 10 mil vapor barrier and put a little stone on top of that. And then now put your dehumidifier in and you'll it'll work very efficiently. Don't you, you think, guys yeah. believe that Steve's basement is full right up to the top step of the of the stairway, <laughs> just full of junk. Well, the problem is I don't have a full cellar. I just have crawl spaces. Well, that I love oh. crawl spaces. Crawl spaces are my just, favorite. They're dry, and yep. you know, center chimney with the rubble foundation on the chimney, and I just have two very small uh, concrete floored cellars. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's the granite blocks that are kind of leaky, right? Yeah, so just have that repointed. And that's not very expensive to have it repointed. Okay. If you're talking about going around the house like that, as long as the, the stones don't have to be reset, they're just repointing, it's probably around $2,000, $1,500. Okay. 
Oh, and a mason and could do that. Mason right? And that will help keep the mice out of your basement as well. Well, that's true too. That's good. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks for the question, Beverly. Um, let's address this question relating to collaborates because there was a question sent in and someone just put it in the chat. Um, best type of clabbered and Steve can or both of you can talk about the cut of clabbered is very important for holding paint and this person um Carol Styles says should I replace very old distressed wood clabbers can they hold paint for more than a couple of years who wants now, to Car Carol style Taris, Carol Styles gets should get a star on her forehead because Carol Styles has done an amazing job on her property in Stratford. Yay, Carol. Absolutely amazing. She just, last year, I think it was, Carol, and jump in if, if I'm wrong, just finished painting the exterior of her barn. It's got to be close to 100 feet long. Woo! Inside. And it's, it's, absolute, it's absolutely spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. Great. So to get to your answer, Carol, um, we've used two types of clabberts. Basically, we use a spruce, a quarter sawn, extra clear spruce clabbered or a cedar clabbered. There again, those are all quarter sawn. Um, and the cedar needs to be primed, back primed. Everything needs, always needs to be back primed before you install it. The cedar needs to be back primed with an oil based primer. If you're going to use, if you're going to use the spruce, you can do a a paint like we've been using Sherwin Williams now for probably 30 years, their duration paint, and um, it's self priming. So you can prime, give the first coat, which act, will that it'll back prime as well as front prime for your first coat and use that. And you too thin your clapboards that are coming down or falling down or split or broken. There again, the 50% rule. And I know your house, your house doesn't have 50% on any of the sides that need to be so that they all don't need to be replaced. It's all tooth being too thin. Um, and that's all I got. Okay, and I will include a source of at least the quarter quarter sawn spruce in my follow up email. Ward Clabber Mill out of Vermont because I know that they're hard to find. They are hard to find, and they're very Ward Clabber Mill has been great over the years. Um, as everybody knows, material costs have gone up 25 30 yeah. percent. Ward Clabber Mill has not done that. They've yeah. kept their prices more reasonably. Uh, uh, available to, to customers and they're really good about this different sizes they have up to a full six inch clabbered down to a four and a half inch wide clapper <laughs> the most important thing is the vertical grain and the yeah. back priming yes you know. absolutely and on the ends too make sure when you cut them prime hey, those ends beverly uh, we just did this to our house can i add a couple of tips oh. that i that i please Please. Is, that Cheryl, is that Cheryl Kimball I see? It, it is. Oh, we boy. we just resided the front of our house, uh, I think a year and a half ago. We used ward, we used quarter sawn spruce. Um, and I just want to say two things. Our, far, our house is farmhouse red. We use a Sherwin-Williams because Steve Bedard insisted that it was the best. And, um, and I recommend they were pre-primed and they were pre-primed with like a light um maybe even white pre-prime primer and the farmhouse red probably should have had a darker primer um because it's probably going to take one more coat than it needed to to um to get it back to the the farmhouse red color it kind of changes the color a little bit um and also i just want to say the house looks it really needed to be done um, the clabbers were probably original to the 1830, 25 house or whatever, and they definitely needed to be done, but the house looks different to me. And I just want to say that it looks too neat. You know what I mean? Um, so I just wanted to make that point, be prepared for it to, I mean, it looks beautiful and I, and it needed to be done, but um, I, I miss my old cranky clabbers. <laughs> Well, next time I drive by, I'll throw a couple of rocks at it or something. See yeah. what we can do a bit. Well, that's yeah, we, just, we just finished we just finished priming um, ten thousand lineal feet of spruce clabbers, and we use a we use a red primer. It's a red barn. We use a red. Mm. We just put some color to the primer, yeah. to the duration. I'm sorry, to duration paint. Yeah, duration. Yeah. Yeah, duration. Yeah. So. But Cheryl, thank you for sharing that because a lot of people don't realize 
why they like the look of an older building. Exactly. A lot of it is part of the collaborate and right. the old windows and and they right. don't realize no. that's the reason, but. Yeah, don't get me wrong. You know, we're not sitting watching television with the breeze blowing through the house anymore. <laughs> and, you know, all that's great. So it had to be done and I'm glad we did it, but it does look very different. Yeah. Well, since we have Cheryl on the screen, let's address your question about squirrels. Do you want to ask Steve or Ian directly, Cheryl? Well, my question was, um, we had many years ago, the corner uh, upper beams of our barn repaired from a lot of squirrel damage and stuff. It may have been 15 years ago now, and it's all happened again. Yeah. Um, and it was a very expensive repair, and I think it was a good repair, um, but I was just wondering how I do everything I can. Um, I've had horses here for years. I make sure, you know, grain's not around. I do feed birds, but um, there it's away from the barn. But is should we have done something like you're mentioning the mesh wire or whatever to discourage this? God, they seem to love this corner of the barn. I remember the corner of the barn really well. <laughs> <laughs> and you had some serious squirrel problems. Almost yeah, like serious problems. Almost looked like raccoon problems. Some of the holes were so big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The wire. If you can't. Yeah. <clears throat> I would. I would use wire lath. No wire lath. I would use uh, hardware cloth over those areas to discourage them. And you. And you've got to do a. You got to go through a, a, a catching a trap. A have a hot trap. Um, I want to use, I want to, Ian, I don't want to shoot things like you do. So I'm going to say catch them and release them. But anyway, you got to release them five miles away from your house. Okay. Um, well, if I tried to shoot them, I'd end up with different kinds of holes in my barn. Right, it's, right. It's, it's, it's pretty hard to keep squirrels out of a, out of a barn. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I remember doing a barn in, in uh, where we were taking apart the soffit from one end to the other. And the squirrels were in that soffit actively in that soft and when I got to take the last board out I had five squirrels run over my shoulder and jump off the ladder <laughs> right right you know it, it, it's pretty difficult and especially if you have like you know uh, uh, some nut trees right around the barn or something like yeah. that you know they're going to be they're going to be there you know yeah they growl at me when I go in the barn yeah <laughs> so Cheryl do they actually gnaw on the beams or are they just gnawing on planks Oh no, they're they're building their nests in the beam. I mean, they they really have gnawed <clears throat> into the beam, and and have that's where their little nest they, is. They, they like soffits, you know, and they will they'll really tunnel and run, run right along a soffit. I mean, the problem is where they do make a nest. You know, if they're there for a long period of time, they can cause rot. You know, in the yeah. timber right there, and 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 can cause significant rot. To be honest, so yeah. you know, when you see them around, it's worthwhile doing an inspection. You know, if, if it's a barn, go up inside and see where the nests are and and just, you know, yank them out, you know, yank the nests out, put some hardware cloth in there and, and um, you know. Okay, I think I need to invest in hardware cloth. Have you, have you, oh. have you tried just talking to them, Cheryl? Oh, <laughs> sure, of course. I talk to them all. They growl at me. They really do. They run along the top of the window and growl at me when I come in the door. Don't, uh, don't do poison. Don't ever do poison. Oh, no, no, I would never. No. If you got to release, you got to release them five miles from your house, otherwise they'll come back. Okay, you're more than five miles from my house, so I'm I'm I, I, yeah, I release everything I got over at Steve's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That explains. Well, somebody's that. releasing them at my house. That's the problem. We actually, the other day, we actually caught seven gray squirrels in one day, and moved them. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so. And someone said in the chat, make sure there's a river in the midst of those yeah, five miles. Between you, it's a good idea, Maggie. <laughs> I'm not taking credit, but all right. Oh, we that's have a one. great tip. <laughs> Charlotte no Crane said that. Make sure there's a river. Charlotte Crane. Thank you, Charlotte. Couple more questions um, that were sent in in advance, and then I see some new ones in the chat. So um, Judith Judith Kushner sent in this, which is a great question regarding steep stairs. I think this is a tough one. Suggestions to deal with steep stairs, 10 or so steps with very narrow front to back treads, eight inches deep. Stair has walls. 
have the host dealt with these in their work and what was the outcome? Our house has these, but not a problem, working with another older house that has them and it is a problem there. So well, do you have any um, ideas, Steve? I have lots of ideas. Is it a, I have to know though, is it a, is it a center chimney house? Judith, it, do you wanna unmute yourself? I know she was. I no, they're not centered. Oh well, one is ours is sort of, but the one I'm considering is not a center chimney. So it's a well, back. It's confusing. So it's a, it may have been, but it's just an old, rough place. But go ahead. I'll listen. Well, you can usually mod if there's a an area behind at the top of the stairway or below the stairway that you can get, uh, gather up some space from. You can typically gain enough. Uh, space there to re to um, at least reduce that rise and run. You probably have like a, a nine inch rise and an eight inch tread. Does that sound about right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have a back stairway like that at home that we don't use very often. We also, but we have a new front stairway that we put in probably 25 years ago that is very comfortable uh, and probably an eight and eight, eight foot, I mean an eight, eight inch rise and a, probably a nine inch tread or something like that. Um, so you, usually if there's space ahead of it or, or below it, you could make that change. It just, you need to do some planning and looking at the, looking at the situation. Concerning yeah. the width, that gets more difficult because when you widen that, I, I'm, it's probably just three feet wide now or 32 inches wide, maybe. Yes. Width is a more, is more difficult because you talk about moving that wall, um, either side of the stairway to be able to make, accomplish that. So you're, you're saying usually you would have to turn a corner and get a landing in there, something like that, Steve? Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes, sometimes the, you know, if they had a center chimney and they removed it, that space where the center chimney was before is available to extend that stairway if it goes up towards it. Yep. Otherwise, you do have to wind up putting a landing in and then turning it. Yep. That, that's really another option. Thank you. No problem. Okay, and then Judith sent in a photo. Let me see if I can grab it. Um, there we go. Can you see that? Can everybody see? Yep. Yes. Okay. Steve, um, she asks, are the boards between the windows in the photo a decorative feature that's original, do you suspect? I, I have just to... I'd have yeah. to see it. I'd have to see it blown up. Sorry. Be able to look at the detail of it blown up no. to see if if the any other detail of the window trim matches any of those pieces, or if those pieces just have a simple bead on them, or not. It, it's just a decorative feature in an old cape. We it, have it, them too. It just it, wondered. It typically is. It typically would be a decorative feature. I mean, you, you've got some very interesting, it looks like you have dental, some type of dental, and I, I can't see it very well, but dental um, um, trim trim feature on over your wainscoting and for your chair rail. And then you've got, I'm going forward here a little bit. Uh, and then you've got wonderful d detail around your windows. And it looks like you have um, eight, uh, 12 over eight windows. Actually, this is not our house. Our house is much uh, simpler. Uh, oh. Probably was a lot cheaper. Okay, but it has okay. the same feature of the wood between the wood slats or whatever between the windows. But there's no other wood slats anywhere else in the house. Any other, oh, in both of room. the front, both of the front, quote unquote, front facing window uh, duos have mm -hmm. this these little boards. And I just wondered, is that was that just a decorative idea? I'm not. Uh, yeah, it'd be it'd be hard to tell without physically looking at it or having a close up that I could hold. Okay. You know, a bl this really house, blow up well. Yeah, this house is a an old house, one of the old cheap houses, I guess, in Maine. It's not ours. Do you just, know what year? Do you know what year it was built? I don't know that one. Ours is probably 1830s. Okay. Okay. By the way, that looks like calcimine on that plaster there too. It does. Oh, um, it really does. Yeah. Yeah, we had that as well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop share there. Every time I do that, I lose my screen. Okay, I think that is it for the, oh no, there's actually one more. Let me see if I can get back to this. Hold on just a second. 
Um, here we go. Can everybody see this barn? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Ian, the questions on this one were just some really general, um, they're new owners of this barn and what order did they tackle the needed repairs? Well, they got they got uh, foundation failure. It's a bank barn. I don't know what the foundation on the other side of the barn looks like if it's bulging or if it's got, you know, problems there. But I mean, uh, you can see on the left hand side, it looks like that. I, I mean, it's hard to see, but it almost looks like the corner post of that gable is not even supported, but I it'd have to be able to blow up the picture to see that and, and the posting in the basement, you know, and, and from the added posting there too. Uh, and it looks like there might be some sill problem right there as well. So when that when the posting gets taken care of on that side of the barn, the, the sill is gonna have to get taken care of at the same time. Um, this is, so, I mean, so this is one of those barns where I look at and I say, well, you gotta take care of, you know, the, found, the posting in the basement, get rid of the organic matter, um, take care of the foundation. And if that sill there has a problem in it, um, you know, then, then you really want to pick that barn up a little bit higher to fix that sill, you know, above that sill, you know, so you're going to take off some of the siding to, to support that thing, you know, I mean, it's hard to say without looking at the interior, you know, which side the cows were on and what the first floor looks like, you know, but it, but the foundation, the posting and the foundation is, is obviously got to get fixed. You know, you look at the, look at the top of the, once again, I look at the, the, uh, the soffit up there and it doesn't look like it has any big real problems in it. Um, so, you know, it, it'd be good to do that posting soon um, and get it on good footings, which could once again be just stone on, on some good crushed stone base. You know, it doesn't have to be concrete. And this might be a good candidate for an assessment grant too, just to get- Yeah, it. well, and, with yeah. The, and the, reason, the reason I would say that is just because if you go inside the barn, let's say that side of the, that side of the barn, you go inside and, and, and the cows were on that side and the first floor has, has problems, you know, like the joists and things are starting to really have problems. Then that really sort of directs you more to wanting to, you know, uh, crib that thing and, and pick it up above that first floor level and fix that sill and everything and fix the foundation all at that one time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and that was sent in by Tyler. Tyler. Oh, but I can see. Well, I can see that that corner is supported on that upper right-hand picture. So that's that's good news. Yeah, it, it's a pretty. You can actually go all the way through. So that's not a closed-off basement. The other no, side. No, I can see. I can see the other gable end is open too, right? Yeah. Um, so we, we've had a couple of people look at it, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, this will be easy because you can access the whole thing to lift it up." Well, but that's you're right. That, but how's that, the foundation well, on the other side of the barn? Uh, it, uh, this is the good side. Okay, but is, is the foundation on the other side of the barn bulging in, or is it is it got problems with it? Stones moving on it? Uh, no, but it, it looks very similar to this in the sense that it's it's supported by some posts that were put in later. Oh. In the, it's not uh, open on the other side of the barn, though, is it? It, it is open. Really. So we have good airflow through there, but yeah, right back of this barn is a stream uh, that this under the barn does get does get wet, but there's airflow through there. Um, and how's but, the how's the first floor framing above when you're in the barn in the basement and you're looking up? How's that first floor framing framing look? It, it's it's pretty rotted. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. So um, that 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 gets to be the problem when you're supporting the barn, you're picking it up to do redo the posting or something like that because you got to pick it up from a place where it's secure, you know, yeah. and, if, and if it's got rot in that first floor framing, then usually I would say, okay, well, you're going to, the better, the better thing to do is to take out the floor and, and, uh, and pick it up, you know, fasten your steel or whatever up higher on the posts up higher and support it up there. And then you can redo the, the, uh, the supports in the basement and, uh, and the floor at the same time. You can, you can, if it, if it's possible and like, that's a ticket item that isn't appealing you can add timbers underneath, you know, and basically build a new support underneath the rotten ones above you, but that doesn't solve the sort of problem, you know, but that, you know, I, I, where you've got a huge barn, you know, and, and you've got a whole first floor that you've got to replace, and that can be a pretty, pretty good sized ticket, you know, and so that, that's another way of looking at it, you know, so you add 
he had you know timbers underneath and uh and and sort of bypass taking out the rod above you you know i prefer to i would prefer to see it all fixed but yeah 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 and i guess that that sort of led into my original question was if we're going to do this in stages i'd be curious to know yeah what that first floor and i'm going to call it leveling the barn out yeah so we've been sort of told oh lift it up level it out and that will really bring things back in line and then concentrate on one wall at a time right so so what i would say say is if, if the first floor framing is suspect and it really has a problem which you know you can get somebody to come out and have a look at it um then then i would say doing the posting in the basement and the foundation and fixing that first floor is all one phase you know yeah. um uh because you can't redo the posting in the basement and then come back later and say okay we're going to fix those timbers above them because you're going to take out all that posting to do it you know because yeah. that's what's supporting them so it's better just to get all all that done you know if you were if you were putting if you were sistering a new timber underneath and putting new posting and just forgetting about the rot then you could do that but that's a pretty tricky tricky thing to do you know because you have to take out those posts in order to do it so it has to have, has to be somebody who really knows what they're doing and also has a little bit of gumption to do that you know um i i would i would if you're going to use the barn i would replace the first floor you know if it's okay, got and i have to interrupt you at this point it's six o'clock i just want to do my wrap up comments and then if ian and steve are okay with staying on for a few more minutes to address a couple questions yeah. But, we'll but, do that after. Yeah, let me just say something because I don't want to leave them okay. hanging there. You know, um, it, 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 where where are they located? Uh, we're in New London, New Hampshire. Okay, all right. It'd be worthwhile. Awesome. Some, it'd be worthwhile having somebody you know have a look at that first floor framing, and then that'll answer the question for you. You know. Okay. 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 Thanks, Ian. Great. Thank you. All right, so great questions, everybody. This has really been really informative. I hope you feel so too. Um, if we didn't get your question answered or you have additional follow-up questions, feel free to email them to me or call and we'll deal with them um, as best we can. I encourage you to also check out our website if you haven't already, nhpreservation.org. There's lots of great resource information on there. Um, the barn assessment grant program there's also a barn tax incentive program we didn't even touch on yet today um if you have a historic barn and your town participates in the program you may be able to get some property tax relief on that barn details are on our website and again i'm happy to answer questions about that um before we end today though we always love to give away door prize and maggie steer my colleague is on here and will help with that maggie do you want to pick the door prize winner for today which well, is i think you ought to hold up the door prize oh sorry yes jim garvin's book on building history of northern new england a fascinating resource book with all kinds of wonderful information and maggie's going to pick the lucky winner well, in honor of President's Day, oh. I was hoping we would have someone named George in the audience, and we do. So the winner is George Kraus. Yay. George, are you on? I hope. Is he still on, Maggie? Yes, um, I am. Woohoo! Okay. Can, can you put your video on so we can see you, George? Tell oh, us boy. where you live. Oh, boy. Is yeah. that too much pressure? There, he is. Pressure. <laughs> <laughs> there you are yeah and i live in center monster oh great, oh, great. okay yep. so i so see steve on a regular basis but all of our little uh, restaurants and and convenience stores are closing so we don't we don't run into each other near as much oh okay well we hope you enjoyed this book we'll send it out to you or you can come by our offices and pick it up so we'll be yeah. in touch yeah all george right, i'll you. connect with you Thank you. Perfect. All right. And as I have mentioned multiple times, I'll be sending a follow up email tomorrow to all the participants with all kinds of wonderful links and additional information, including um, upcoming programs. And one I just want to mention, we have our preservation conference in person this year, May 19th. So mark your calendars that will be in. Uh, Maggie, help me out. Claremont. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, and again, we're hoping to have another one of these programs in March. So we will let you all know through an upcoming email. Um, and many people have been asking about our Old House and Barn Expo that we had to cancel in 2020. Haven't had an in-person one since then. And we are in the early stages of planning that for spring of 2024. So we will keep you posted on that. So again, I wanna thank Ian and Steve for sharing their expertise and answering all these great questions from um, you Old House and Barn owners. I wanna thank our Old House and Barn sponsors, which are listed on our website, Steve and Ian being a part of that group. Um, and I just wanted to thank all of you for doing the incredible work that you're doing to save New Hampshire's historic houses and barns, because they're really a treasure to our state and really important to the residents of New Hampshire, but also the tourists who come to our state to see these beautiful buildings. So thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future programs. And of course, if you're interested in donating to us, we'd be more than happy, happy to accept a donation or please consider a membership. All can be done on our website. And so I'm gonna wrap up here. Thank you all for joining. Have a great evening. Thank if you, you wanna stay on for a little bit for a few additional questions. I know there's one, Sarah Nyland, Highland, sorry, has asked about vapor barriers. So maybe Steve can address that, but thank yeah. you all for joining. Beverly, is there a link to the, to the uh, slideshows on barns and stuff like that to the talks that people um, can? On our website and I'll put that information. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. And a recording of this program will be posted on the website as well. And I'll get all that in the email for everybody tomorrow. Good question, thank you. So Steve, do you wanna address vapor barriers? What specifically about vapor barriers? Um, maybe let's start in the basement or a wet area of the house, but basement floor, <clears throat> crawl space floor. Um, First thing you want to do is, is there again, you want to change, change, make sure you have water that's coming off your roof and running away from your building and not running in the basement. Otherwise, you're just, you're not really helping yourself. So once you get that resolved and you get the water, so it's not coming through your basement, then you can remove any organic material, rotted soil, get that raked out of there, get it raked out pretty cleanly. And then you're going to install a vapor barrier, um, a 10 mil vapor barrier. Um, that you can, you don't have to be one piece. You can piece it together and tape it together, which is going to keep the moisture down. Then you can you can add a little gravel on top of that, or sand, or round river stone, or anything like that, um, which will hold it in place and make it so when you walk on it slightly once in a while, you won't be damaging it. Um, at that point, you're going to put a dehumidifier in that is, you don't have to, not the kind that you have to empty the bucket when it fills up, but it goes to a drain so that you don't have that issue and you're getting rid of the moisture. We talked about earlier, we talked about sealing up the foundation or any cracks that's above grade level at least, um, keeping every, all the windows closed, the bulkhead closed. And therefore, um, and, and I usually set, I know when our, our dehumidifiers, I believe I set them at about 60%. If you set them much lower than that, even though it's better, it, your, your dehumidifier will never stop running. And so uh, we usually go about 60% is what we, and we run them from May until October, roughly speaking. Okay, and Steve, the interface between the edge of the vapor barrier and your foundation wall, do you have any tricks? That's really hard hard to deal with. We've we've been, in some instances, you can um, put some caulking material and stick the, um, vapor, run the vapor barrier up around the edge a little bit. But basically we just try to cut it as close to the edge as we possibly can. It's pretty heavy material, but you can cut it with a exacto knife or you can cut it with some good shears get it as tight as you get to the, to the edge. And that will really keep the moisture down um, as much. If you have a, a, a block foundation or a concrete foundation, you can glue that right directly or tape it right directly to that foundation. But if it's rubble stone, it's really difficult to make that connection. And then I kind of worry about water infiltration coming down the foundation wall. And I know you were supposed to have dealt with that, but you're going to deal with it. Water comes in. Water 
the water problem first and then the vapor barrier after that. Yeah. Okay. What about what about walls, Steve? What about walls? Well, uh, let's say somebody's somebody's got uh, you're blowing in insulation and no vapor barrier there. What you what, what do you what do you think about that? When you're dealing with that. You're talking about above the foundation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're talking yeah. about you're, you're talking about in the in the house itself. Yes. Yeah. I just want you to address that for people because somebody's going to ask that question. But yeah, it's a it's a huge issue. Um, if you're doing a major renovation, you can put a vapor barrier in a six mil vapor barrier in as you're building and do that. Um, if you don't, you can use vapor barrier paint, which is available, which helps a little bit. We haven't had any problems with moisture as long as the exterior is sound and as long as you're not in the area of the bathrooms. Kitchens can provide a lot of moisture also, but basically you have an exhaust fan there. So you want to have an exhaust fan if you can in your bathroom too. On a, we put them on a timer so you can actually time the amount. If you go in and take a shower, the timer goes on. You can turn the timer on for a variety of five to 20 minutes. And it'll exhaust all that moisture out. You're trying to keep that moisture out of the building so it won't want to migrate through your sidewalls. I'm going to throw another question in because I got you here, Steve. Let's it, it, talking about vapor barrier. And let's say somebody's residing in a whole old house. What do you what do, what is your recommendation when it comes to people a contractor that might want to put some kind of, you know, uh, type R or some kind of paper on the outside? That's a huge problem. Okay, I, that's why I'm asking. We, <laughs> we typically, we typically don't do it. Okay, that's we typically why we don't do it. We went, we just went through this process with um, the uh, um, John Prescott Chase House in Epping, where they were trying to get to net zero, so they were trying to do some type of a vapor barrier on, the, not a vapor barrier, but an in, air infiltration barrier on the outside. We finally went with a rain barrier, yep. but the issue is with all of these barriers is they have to be continuous. Yep. So unless you can take off all the trim on your house, window trim, corner boards, all those things, you're not going to get a continuous barrier. And right. the strips are only three feet wide anyway, so you're going to be using a tape. Yep. And you're, you're putting it on so that the water can actually run down and continue out the bottom. So in this instance, we used, we used a, it's called a, a rain barrier. And it has these little raised humps in them that are minuscule. And the, the idea is if, if any water gets behind the siding or sheathing, it has a chance to run in. It allows air to move water moisture to run through from the house into that area. It is supposed to run down the face of it behind all your clapboards and trim and come out below your water table. Yep. You, you don't that mind me saying I, you don't mind me saying I don't have a lot of faith in those little microscopic runnels there. I'd rather see that have nothing there. <laughs> we um I'm going to say 95% of the time or more, we don't put anything on the outside because we take perfectly good 18th century clapboards off yep. to do repairs and the clapboards are fine with no vapor bar with no uh, barrier on the outside. So why put one in? Yep. There you go. Why do that? Steve, Steve, did that add depth to the wall? So you had to adjust the trim? No, it's, it's, no. it's minuscule. It's very, very minor. I, I, it's, it's not even a six, it's probably a 30 second or a 60 foot of an inch. Okay. Something like that. All right. All right. One last question that I see I missed here. What is the life of log beams holding up my floors? They are not even debarked. So I guess that depends on the moisture level of their basement, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. Exactly. That's the way that's why it's important to run a dehumidifier sometime, you know. And I think it, it, it's all about that. It's all about the the the, uh, the, the conditions in the basement whether it's a barn or a house. I've seen them where there's been bark over the whole thing and they're fine. I've seen them there's been no bark and they've been fine. I've seen them where there's no bark and they've been a disaster. You know, it's purely purely that that issue. All of these timbers in a barn or a house were put in when they were green. They were never dry when they put them in. So they've dried on their own. So, so let me ask you a question, Steve. When you go into a basement of an old house and they've done bricking on the foundation, you know, that that is you know, going up to the floor level, you know, so it blocks out where the sill is. You see that sometimes, you know. Sometimes you see that, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you see um, bricking behind the behind the, the granite slabs too. Yeah. Well, if it's coming up and it's it's encapsulating that the wood sill, would you recommend taking that bricking out? Is there a problem with the sill? 
Well, how would you know? I mean, my question, my question is, does it does it lock moisture in behind that bricking? You know, uh, it you know really what I'm saying because they used to put them in there for for I don't know if it was for environment control or breeze or what have you, but you know, you. It's really hard to tell. I mean, if you have a double, you've seen double double sealed buildings before too. We have an eight inch gap between yeah, the two yeah, the yeah. two sills, and they can be granite on the outside and brick on the inside, yeah. and, and or stone on the inside. It, it's really hard to tell. So it's a per on a per basis situation. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. And there again, if the atmospheric atmospheric conditions are a certain way and it works, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't touch it. I'd leave it alone. Okay. Peter, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, I just, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, how, what is the life expectancy of those beams? I do not have a water problem. Um, you know, it's, it's a small area where I do have a furnace. I do have a washer and a dryer, however, and the rest is crawl space, but you know, they're probably 220 years old. I just, you know, are they moving? <laughs> you know, I mean, are they going to pull out of the... <laughs> probably not. If you, if you, if they seem to be in good condition, they could last another 200 years. Well, it really depends okay. on the situation. It really depends on the situation. If you take an ice pick uh, or an awl and pop a it up... A quarter there, of an inch? If you, if you can go in less than, if you're only going less than an inch, you're probably okay. If it's more than an inch, then maybe you've got issues. And then at that point, you may not even be talking about replacing the timbers. You might be talking about sistering timbers yeah. okay. alongside of them and through bolting. It's very important that you through bolt when you do that. Okay, no, thank you. No. Ian, what do you think? You got any ideas about that? Yeah, I mean, I you know, <laughs> I, I always look at the fact that if, it's, if, if there's not a lot of moisture in the basement, he goes with a nice pick and he's, he's poking at it and they seem fine. My viewpoint is they've been there for a long time. They'll be there for a long time to go. <laughs> yeah, you know? me too. I, mean, I think both, we're, we're, we're a lot more temporal than they are. <laughs> I, I think Ian and I have the same approach in that we, we, we tend to really be conservative about doing things and we really rely on common sense. Yeah. And, and, and not, I mean, we've seen situations, I, I know he has and I have too, where where they, you know, they hire an engineer. Oh, you got to dig up all your foundation all the way around your building, and put in French drains. And you know, what well, we ought to get rid of this stone while we're here, and think about pouring a a, a a concrete wall. Most of the time, that's not necessary. And it's just we'd rather see you save your money and put it into the rest of the building, the rest of the barn, or the rest of the house. Yeah. Okay. Was... One final question, or maybe it's two questions. From Melissa and Marshall Hopper, which is where we had our barn workshop this past summer. Um, how do you, they want to replace footings, I guess, in the basement, and they want to know or support beams in the basement, and how deep does that concrete footing need to be or not be? Barn or house. Your, head, your face. Barn or house. Barn. Um, I. I and so you 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 guys had a, you had to get rid of the organic matter that was down there. Um, but we uh, did. You did. Okay. Well, as far as I'm concerned, after that, you know, you dig down a you know a, you know a couple of feet and throw some nice washed uh, uh, stone in there, um, you know, which has a nice 99% compaction, and put a nice big granite stone on that, and you're good to go. Okay. Yeah, you, know, I, you don't you don't have to go you don't have to dig four feet down or three feet down or anything like that once you take care of the moisture and the stuff that's happening down there and you put it on some nice crushed stone you'll be good yep that's that's good that's good okay and melissa do you want to ask your question about the cracks in the beams and the cracks in the foundation well it's so hard to find you know anyone who seems to you know be a good fit we had one guy who swears that he sees ghosts and wants to charge us $60,000 for this foundation work. And then we have another person who says he'll do it in two days for 7,000. So, I, I mean, there's no in between. So um, I do I have seen a brand new barn that this man built and we've engaged him to work on our barn, but there are, there are cracks like splits on all of the beams and the building's less than a year old. You know, all the support beams, they've all just, they've got these great big uh, splits in, in all of them. And I'm yeah. just wondering, 
why uh, you had you had that problem on that the uh the far side away from the house you know where where things weren't connecting right in there you know and you had some big timbers that were sistered on underneath you know where the floor was and those had cracks some cracks in them. i'm not worried about those cracks those are huge timbers you know um that doesn't bother me that they were put in there green and they're just drying out you know okay. Um, that, okay. that other side needed some connection stuff to take care of you know uh, my advice would be to uh to uh um uh, you know, uh, get a, uh, you know, a written recipe, a written, you know, have an assessment done, which gives you that written recipe. And that's what you follow. And you have your client, your uh, contractor come in and you can say, these are the things we want to have done. You know, so you're not, you're not getting, you're not getting a lot of different opinions and getting sort of a smorgasbord. It kind of lays out what needs to happen, you know. Well, you did come and you, you had, gave you the assessment. Some different, you had some just, we can't remember everything you said, yeah. so we don't know yeah. what to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's why it's a good idea. I always tell people when you have somebody come in like me or Steve or something like that to, to take your phone and film us, you know, and then yeah. you can put it down on your computer and you can have it there. I mean, I mean, you know, Steve's a good looking guy. I'm not. So you might not want to film me. But, uh, oh, come on. Oh, come yeah, on, Ian. Now. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Oh, that, makes, come that, on. That, that, that makes sense. What he says makes but, sense. But, but, you know, have somebody have, you can have one of us come out and walk through. I mean, I, you know, I can, I would come out if I'm driving by and walk through it again and you can film it or something like that, you know. That'd be great because we feel like a couple of helpless Hannahs and we don't want to get it wrong. Your your yeah. barn wasn't going anywhere in a hurry. So don't 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 panic, you know. Okay. Okay. So Melissa, let's connect again. I mean, yeah, let's connect again and see how we can move help you move this forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining. All right. I think we've covered all the questions that have been submitted. So it's now 623. So we better let Steve and Ian go. And I just want to thank everybody again for joining. It's been really informative, and I hope you felt so too. And again, feel free to reach out to us at any time. <laughs>